Senator Cruz, uh, thank you so much for being with us. By the way, I'm sure I'm not the first. Uh, I want to tell you how great I think you look with your new beard. I think it's a great look. <laughs> thank you, Mort. And by the way, you were handsome without the beard, so you can go either way. You'll look fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I checked with your wife. She agrees. <laughs> Very good. Um, but it's, 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 it's really a special, truly a special honor for me to be introducing one of the greatest senators in America, really. <clears throat> and uh, one of the greatest patriots in America. <laughs> Senator Cruz's extraordinary feelings for the Jewish state of Israel and the Jewish people is really uncanny and unsurpassed. There are few Jews who feel as strongly and as committed to the Jewish state as Senator Ted Cruz. <laughs> and uh, we're very fortunate to have someone with his enormous intellect and breadth of knowledge to be on our side. Uh, uh, he's famous for having won uh, two national debates when at Princeton University as a, one of the greatest debaters in America. And it's no wonder that when Professor Alan Dershowitz, uh, who uh, gave the ZOA Sheldon Adelson Award uh, at the ZOA dinner to Senator Ted Cruz, Professor Dershowitz said, Senator Cruz was the most brilliant student I had in 50 years of teaching at Harvard Law School. That's quite a statement. Uh, he even said to me privately, I don't know if I've ever said this publicly, he said, I stopped calling on Ted Cruz in class because I didn't want to be bested in class discussions by Ted Cruz. <laughs> so it is a, a great honor to uh, uh, introduce to you one of the greatest patriots, one of the greatest Zionists, uh, one of the greatest uh, senators I've ever known in my 27 years of working in this business, uh, Senator Ted Cruz. Well, thank you very much, Mort. Thank you for your tremendous friendship. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, and, and, and let me say to, to everyone on this call, th thank you for, for your commitment uh, to Israel, your commitment to America, uh, and your commitment to truth. Uh, ZOA is, is extraordinary and, and, and I believe unique. Uh, there is nobody else that occupies a space like ZOA, which is taking on issues that matter, matter intensely for the safety and security of the United States and matter intensely for the safety and security of Israel, and does so with such an utter fearlessness and commitment to clarity and truth. Uh, this is an area of foreign policy of national security policy where, where everyone knows there's a great deal of diplomatic doublespeak and deliberate ambiguity and gamesmanship. And ZOA has always been near and dear my heart uh, because y'all don't engage in BS. You will speak the truth when it needs to be heard. And, and, and I am grateful for that. That is desperately, desperately needed. You know, if you look at where we are in terms of the United States relationship with Israel, I think it is difficult to find any area of policy on which there has been a more dramatic change in the last four years compared to the eight years that preceded it. Uh, under the Obama-Biden administration, we saw a manifest hostility to Israel that grew and grew dramatically. Uh, it was finally laid bare, laid naked for the world to see with UN Resolution 2334, which as everyone knows, the Obama administration orchestrated after the election in 2016, uh, afraid of, of being called out for their strong anti-Israel position, they were content to let the UN play the role of hatchet man in the weeks immediately following the 2016 election. And, and Resolution 2334 disgracefully embodies a lie right at the heart of Israel. It claims much of modern Israel is illegal and illegitimately uh, occupied territory. It claims much of old Jerusalem, the J Jewish quarter, is illegally occupied territory. It claims the Wailing Wall, 
where President Obama so famously uh, put out a picture of him respectfully standing with a yarmulke. Well, under 2334, which his administration orchestrated, it claims the Wailing Wall is illegally occupied territory. It was a lie, and it was a lie designed to be used by haters of Israel to attack Israel going forward. In the aftermath of 2334, I introduced legislation that would cut off funding for the UN unless and until they repealed Resolution 2334. I wish, uh, I wish the administration had been willing to fight on that front, but they were not. What they were willing to do though, if you take a shift from where Obama Biden was to the Trump administration, it is a 180 degree shift. Uh, and I wanna highlight two decisions in particular that I think were, were very consequential. Uh, one decision is moving our embassy to Jerusalem. Now, as everyone on this call knows, that has been uh, an evergreen promise of American presence. Uh, Republicans and Democrats both made that promise, and then Republicans and Democrats both got elected and broke the promise. Uh, it, was, it was one of the few areas of bipartisan agreement that you broke the promise to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Um, in the Trump administration, the beginning of the administration, there was a vigorous argument within the administration on whether to move the embassy to Jerusalem. Uh, both the State Department and the Defense Department opposed moving the embassy. You had Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, you had Secretary of Defense Mattis, both of whom leaned in hard. The argument they made is they said, if we move the embassy, it will enrage the enemies of Israel, and it will make it harder to achieve Middle East peace. I can tell you, I engaged vigorously in that argument, both publicly, but even more vigorously, privately with the president directly making the case that moving the embassy was the right thing to do, that the enemies of Israel already hate us and wanna kill us, and they're not gonna wanna kill us anymore, and that if in dealing with the Middle East and the world, that there is a virtue, and it's a virtue we talked about right at the beginning of this call that ZOA embodies, a virtue and clarity, that moving the embassy would be seen by Israel's friends and Israel's enemies alike as a clarion statement that the United States stands with Israel and will not be uh, cowed by the New York Times, by the chattering class, by the condemnation, well, at the end of the day, President Trump agreed with me on the issue and overrode his own State Department and his own Defense Department, announced the moving of the embassy. That was an historic move, and it was a courageous move. After that announcement was made, a lot of the folks on this call, y'all are veterans of a lot of bureaucratic infighting within administrations. You've seen it happen before. It was lost on nobody that after the announcement was made, much of the career staff at State in particular wanted to do everything they could to stop that decision from being executed. So the career staff at State wanted a long drawn out search process that would conveniently take four years to search for a site for an embassy in Jerusalem and just never happened to ha happen in the hopes that, that a Joe Biden would come in and, and end the decision they disagreed with so strongly. Um, I got to tell you, one of the most important decisions that was made is the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, who's become a very close friend, and I work with, with David a lot, uh, took the lead on driving forward, moving the embassy. And David and I talked quite a bit about this on making it happen. And as, as David and I talked, I said, look, if this isn't executed, if the embassy isn't opened, uh, the State Department will kill it. They will drag it out long enough that, 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 that are able to be canceled. And miraculously, David cut through the bureaucracy, found the location where the embassy stands today, and, and, and moved forward to open it. And I got to tell you, I, I flew to Israel. I was there for the opening of the embassy. And it was powerful. I mean, it was an incredible, uh, there were, 
I have never seen such joy and jubilation in the streets of Jerusalem as, the, as there was on that day. And, and I still recall visiting with, with both Americans and Israelis who were there for the opening. And I remember one woman in particular who, who was a Holocaust survivor. And, and she had tears in her eyes. And she just said to me, she said, I never thought I'd live to see this day. And it was a powerful, powerful embodiment of America's unequivocal support for Israel. That led to the second foreign policy decision that, 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 that is inextricably intertwined and I think was the most significant foreign policy decision of the last four years, and that is the Trump administration pulling out of the disastrous Obama-Iran nuclear deal. I do not think it is a coincidence that the decision to pull out of the Iran deal, the announcement was made the week that we opened our embassy in Jerusalem. And, and within the Trump administration, there was likewise a vigorous internal debate. Once again, both state and defense were on the wrong side. Both state and defense were arguing vociferously, stay in the deal, don't pull out of the deal. It's the wrong thing to do. And once again, I engaged hard and vigorously with President Trump directly over and over and over again, both privately and publicly to say this deal is catastrophically dangerous, that I agree with Prime Minister Netanyahu that a nuclear Iran is an existential threat to Israel, and it is also a profound threat to the United States. And, and once again, the president agreed with me and overruled his own State Department and his own Defense Department, and the decision to pull out of that Iran deal uh, was incredibly consequential. Uh, I can tell you in the months and years since that decision, there have been a whole series of additional decisions that were battles that continued to put real teeth in pulling out of the Iran deal. So for example, when, when we initially pulled out of it, uh, we had in place a series of waivers, an oil waiver that allowed Iran to sell a million barrels of oil a day. It was funding the regime. They were selling it primarily to China and India. We had, they, we had civilian nuclear waivers that allowed Iran to continue so-called civilian nuclear work uh, despite pulling out of the deal. And, and I began a series of public and private battles with the administration to end these waivers and making the case repeatedly on the oil waivers. There was a battle within the administration. State, yet again, was on the wrong side. But this time, thankfully, the Department of Energy was on the right side, so we had an ally within the administration. State argued if you end the oil waivers, global oil prices will skyrocket. Energy, whom one might think would know something about energy, uh, argued quite rightly, no, there's plenty of supply. It's not going to have that effect. Again, I engaged really hard with the president and the administration. The president made the right decision, ended the oil waivers. And we now know as an empirical fact, state was wrong and energy was right. Oil prices did not skyrocket. And everything state predicted would happen, every bit of it didn't come to pass. Now, as we sit here in July of 2020, it's a presidential election year. Um, I, for one, deeply hope the president is reelected. I'm working hard uh, to help him be reelected. Uh, but whatever happens in November, there are two decision points in foreign policy that I think are very, very important that should be executed in the next couple of months and that I'm urging the administration right now to execute. Number one is on the Iran deal to exercise the snapback sanctions, which pursuant to the terms of, of, of the UN uh, decision implementing the Iran deal, we have the authority to unilaterally impose the snapback sanctions and reinstate the sanctions based on Iran's now open defiance and breaking of the commitments in the Iran deal. Even though we, with, we, we have withdrawn, we have the authority to invoke the snapback sanctions. I am right now urging the president and the administration to invoke the snapback sanctions. And there is right now yet another battle going on within the administration about whether to do so or not. Uh, a second and, and related matter uh, concerns the International Criminal Court. Uh, 
couple of months ago when, when Prime Minister Netanyahu was in DC, uh, I went and had breakfast with him. The two of us, uh, had a, we've become good friends, but, but as Bibi and I were discussing the challenges facing our, our, our two countries, he raised an issue which actually he had raised the, the first time I met Bibi was in November of 2012, just, just a couple of weeks after I had first gotten elected to the Senate and, and, and went and, and traveled to Israel and met with him then. And even back then, eight years ago, Bibi had raised with me concerns about the ICC, the International Criminal Court, being used as a forum to attack Israel and to attack America. And, and what I am urging the administration to do is to try to get through the UN Security Council now, this year, a decision that says the ICC has no jurisdiction over any country that is not a member country, a party to the treaty. Uh, that decision would protect both America and Israel because we're seeing the ICC being used and abused as a tool to go after both nations. And the virtue of if we can get that through the Security Council now, in order to change it, you'd have to go back through the Security Council, which means any one of the five permanent members could veto it. And so it shifts the status quo and the default. I don't know if that will get done. Again, I'm pressing the administration to make it a priority because in terms of protecting the interest and security of both Israel and the United States, I think it would be a very consequential decision, but that likewise is, is actively being debated within the administration right now. Um, with that, why don't I just open up to questions and we can talk about what, whatever issues y'all like. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll give more at the first question, but before I do, if he wants one, I wanted to mention yeah. a couple of other things that you've <laughs> done. The June 23rd letter, uh, working with ZOA to support sovereignty. We thank you for that. Uh, you've been a leader in the fight to prevent Iran from achieving a military nuclear capability. And uh, something that has also been salient recently, you were the one who asked the <laughs> ambassador to Jordan about the extradition of Al Tamini, who was involved in the Sparrow massacre and is living free in Amman and should be the subject of uh, uh, extradition to the U.S. And so we thank you for all those things. There are so many things you've done that we don't want to neglect to mention any. Thank you. Mort, did you want to ask a question or go right to the ones from our yes. Well, I simply thank you, Senator, for such an eloquent and articulate uh, discussion of important issues that ZOA and uh, most Americans care about. <laughs> I, a very simple question. Uh, what are your thoughts about the possibility of sovereignty, Israeli law being applied to 30% of Judea and Samaria? We thought it was going to happen J July 1st. It has not. We know that there's excuses about the fact that the Chinese virus in Israel has uh, gotten worse, and that's uh, complicating uh, at, at looking into other matters. Uh, do you feel, uh, is, th is this administration committed to supporting sovereignty if Israel wants to move forward with it? And do you think this will happen within the next 30 to 45 days? I hope so. Um, as as uh, Dan noted a minute ago, um, I, I led a letter of senators to the president urging him uh, to support uh, Israel's assertion of sovereignty. Um, that is an issue on which there is an active debate within the administration right now. So there are people on both sides of that issue that are battling it out as we speak. Um, look, my view on sovereignty and my view on, on peace in the Middle East, uh, this administration came in and I know that there's something about that street address, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, that, 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 that when people show up there, they, they seem to have dreams of achieving Middle East peace. Um, I am skeptical that peace is immediately in the offing. I don't think the barrier to peace is Israel. I think nobody wants peace more than the nation of Israel because it is Israeli babies, it is a, Israeli women and children that are being murdered by the terrorists. The barrier to peace is the Palestinian leadership 
And I don't believe we will see meaningful peace unless and until the Palestinian leadership, number one, explicitly acknowledges Israel's right to exist as a Jewish nation, which they still refuse to do. And number two, renounces terrorism. Uh, and, and, and if they're not willing to do those, we're not going to see peace. I don't, I don't think the Palestinian leadership wants to see peace. I also think we've seen administrations, both Democratic and Republican administrations, deeply vested in trying to force a two-state solution. On that question, I, I consider myself agnostic. Um, it has always struck me as arrogant for the United States to try to dictate the terms of peace to Israel. Israel is a sovereign nation and entitled to make decisions about Israel's own sovereignty and security. And so if the leadership of Israel makes a decision that a two-state solution would further their, their security and, and, and peace, as a sovereign nation, that is a decision Israel is entitled to make. If Israel makes a decision that a two-state solution is not the right answer and that a one-state solution would further sovereignty and peace, that's a decision Israel is entitled to make. And I, and I don't agree with the persistent American arrogance of seeking to dictate terms and saying, we're going to tell you how to resolve this. I think America, I think the president can be, can facilitate peace, can try to provide a forum for discussions. But, but as between the government of Israel and terrorists murdering innocents, I am not neutral. Uh, I am unapologetically standing alongside Israel. Um, and so, with the assertion of sovereignty, um, the letter that I brought together a number of senators supporting was trying to encourage the process within the White House. And, and look, frankly, they got cold feet and the Obama-Biden echo chamber ratcheted up to considerable effect and slowed things down. So I don't know what will happen in the next few months, but, but and I don't know where, where other decision makers will land. I can tell you for me, I will remain unequivocally alongside Israel. Thank you, Senator. We've had a number of questions on the same line. Uh, of course, ZOA is a nonpartisan organization and we don't endorse candidates, but we have to all be prepared as pro-Israel advocates for any result of the election. Can you trace out what you think the foreign policy regarding Israel and the Middle East and Iran would be of a Biden administration, and maybe a little bit about your strategy as a pro-Israel person, if that should come to pass, to effectively push for Israel's cause in the Senate during such an eventuality. So, so I fear that foreign policy writ large, but in particular with respect to Israel, would be catastrophically bad in a Bi Biden administration. Um, we have a number of data points to look to. We have, number one, the record of the Obama-Biden administration, of which Joe Biden was obviously an integral part, and it was the most profoundly anti-Israel administration we've seen in modern times. Uh, it was, you know, all of us follow these issues closely, and I suspect many of us remember some years ago, Jeffrey Goldberg had an article in The Atlantic um, that, that, that attracted uh, quite a bit of attention uh, because it quoted a senior official in the Obama-Biden White House uh, referring to Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, with an epithet uh, for poultry manure. And so that got a lot of, lot of noise that that was what the Obama-Biden White House was referring to Netanyahu as. I actually thought in that article that was that wasn't terribly newsworthy. I mean, it was obvious from anyone watching their behavior, that's what they thought of, of Netanyahu. They, they evidenced that every single day. What I thought was much more noteworthy was in the same article, that same senior White House official uh, is quoted as saying that, that, that the best thing about the Iran deal and about the Obama-Biden foreign policy is they felt that they had delayed Israel from acting militarily for long enough that Israel was no longer able to stop 
Iran from acquiring a nuclear arsenal. And it was chilling that that was their perspective is, yay, we stopped Israel from stopping Iran from getting nukes. And they were perfectly fine with a nuclear Iran. A Biden administration, one of the first foreign policy decisions in a Biden administration will be to reinstate the disastrous Obama-Iran nuclear deal. And we will see a nuclear Ayatollah if Joe Biden is elected. That is dangerous as hell. Uh, not only that, look, when I look at U.S.-Israel relations, for a long time there has been a bipartisan commitment to standing with Israel. Uh, I think that bipartisan commitment was badly, badly damaged during the eight years of Obama-Biden. And when it was really put to test was during the Iran nuclear deal, because the Obama White House told Senate Democrats, you pick, you either stand with Israel or you stand with us. And almost without exception, congressional Democrats chose to stand with the Obama White House. That was the beginning of a real shift. We now see the hard left that is on the ascension in the Democratic Party. You see these freshman House members who repeatedly make rabidly anti-Semitic comments and attacks, and, and they're being lionized. They're not only not being condemned, they're being lionized. And I got to tell you, if Joe Biden wins, there's a very real chance Chuck Schumer is majority leader. And for those who think, well, Schumer sometimes talks like he wants to support Israel, it's worth remembering that, that in 2021, if Schumer is majority leader, he will be looking over his left shoulder, terrified out of his mind that AOC is going to primary him. Elliot Engel just got beaten in a Democratic primary. The hard left is attacking Democratic incumbents. And, and I think there is nothing Chuck Schumer would not do to gallop to the left to try to forestall a primary challenge from AOC, given the rabid anti-Israel, anti-Semitism coming from the so-called squad. That is a very dangerous dyna dynamic, and I think there's no universe in which a Biden administration will be able to hold back that angry, angry leftist assault that, that, that sadly, I think, would only grow. Senator, we want to respect your time. I know it's limited. Do you have time for one more question, or should well, we? Well, I'm actually getting the hook. We've got a vote on the Senate floor, so That's I'm being great. told that the, the really clock thank is you. Expiring. We can't tell you how much we appreciate it, and uh, please, thank you. Keep up the work. You guys are amazing. Keep doing what ZOA does. It is important. It is needed. And, and I'm proud to stand alongside you. Thank you so much, Senator. Mort? Yes, thank you, Senator. We're honored to have you with us. And thank God you're in the Senate. And everything we do requires your financial support. Uh, we all know the challenging times every business and nonprofit is in. If you can possibly afford it, we encourage you all to consider a donation to ZOA so we can do programs like this and, and more activities that are making what we all believe in uh, come to fruition.